Hello and welcome to this third video from chapter two from the physics of everyday phenomenon. This is Griffith book here. All right, so, so far we've covered an introduction, a lot of related ideas, talked a lot about movement in general, velocity and speed specifically, defined vector, okay? But I'm not gonna go over that again because we need to move on to our next concept here, acceleration, which I've mentioned many times. What is it, okay? So it's a rate, a rate of change, we call that a rate, right? What is it a rate of? Change in velocity over time, okay? So it measures the rate at which velocity changes per time, okay? So that's interesting because we don't perceive velocity because, as we'll learn, if you're moving at constant velocity, then there's no net force acting on you. Now, we're not moving at constant velocity, we are orbiting around the sun, our planet is spinning around its axis of rotation. However, those resulting accelerations, which are centripetal accelerations, more on that later, those accelerations are pretty uh, like marginal. We're not gonna notice them at all in terms of the dominating much larger force of gravity. So we don't, we don't notice that we aren't moving at constant velocity. In other words, when you sit in your chair, for your, abil your ability to perceive, you are moving at constant velocity. Therefore, you don't feel the movement. You don't feel the orbit around the sun, okay? Because if we were in fact moving in a straight line at the same speed that we're orbiting around the sun, then we truly couldn't feel it, okay? All I'm saying is that there's a small centripetal force because velocity is changing because our heading is changing because we have to complete that circle, which is our orbit, okay? But we definitely feel accelerations that are bigger than those. One acceleration that we feel, of course, is falling, the acceleration that's caused by the force of gravity. We feel accelerations during quick stopping and speeding up in cars, right? Many, direct, many examples of accelerations. Elevators, when they stop and start, they kind of have a startling effect, right? Our body responds to that, okay? So we definitely notice accelerations. Now, what are they? They're just a change in speed. Speed is the magnitude of velocity. So that's one way you can get an acceleration, slowing down or speeding up, or a change in heading, in direction of motion. So if you were heading directly north and then you angled two degrees to the west of north, well, that change would be a form of acceleration, okay? Acceleration is a vector, just like velocity. And of course, you can change direction and magnitude of velocity simultaneously, in which case, you know, that, that would just be a total acceleration. Okay, oh, we're going through these slides. Sorry, that. Okay, All right, so there's a famous expression a silly one, that says it's not the fall that hurts, it's the sudden stop at the end, okay? Now, the fall, you are, right, you're accelerating, certainly, Now, but you're not gonna experience any forces because everything around you is accelerating at the same rate, okay? If we're thinking maybe the case of the elevator in free fall, right, that's in a crash into the ground at the bottom of the elevator shaft, okay? So, in that, in that case then, when, when are you gonna experience a force? Well, you're, you're actually gonna experience force during the much larger acceleration, which is the sudden stop at the end. The free fall is a certain acceleration, one that we'll learn well, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. That is the acceleration shared by all objects with negligible air resistance near or on the surface of Earth. 9.8 meters per second squared, okay? Gravitational acceleration of Earth. Now, that, that value, right, that's significant amount of acceleration, things speed up pretty quickly, but when the elevator comes to a sudden stop at the end, that acceleration is gonna be many times that, right? Maybe 160 G or something. And we can't withstand that much, of accel that much acceleration. So when you think about something hitting the ground, if in a, a less morbid case, let's think about like a fruit, right? You drop like a ripe fruit on the ground and it splatters in the ground. We really see that it, the, the structure of that fruit could not withstand the sudden acceleration that resulted in stopping suddenly upon contact with the ground. Now, obviously there's a lot there to think about what's going on with the forces, the force exerted by the ground on, um, onto the fruit. There's also a conservation of momentum because essentially the ground is unmovable, so it has no you know, significant or measurable amount of movement. So we have that all the, all the change of momentum ends up being imparted to the, um, well, to the um, fruit, right? And that, that's directly related to forces as well. So those are key ideas, momentum, force, but come bringing it back to where we're currently at with acceleration, well, 
it, it is just a sudden acceleration. And that's actually a great way of thinking about it because you could have the same effect of the fruit you know, liquefying if you just, if you reach that same magnitude of acceleration, but more gradually. It's just not something that, you know, you could do in everyday situations, but imagine you're in a spaceship and, you know, opposite of every day, right? And this is a, some futuristic spaceship, so, you know, relatively so. Um, no breaking of physics or anything, so no warp drives, just fast. And it has some sort of, you know, fusion drive or something, and it's just accelerating steadily for a long period of time, okay? And it's accelerating, let's say, at a rate of 1G. Well, if you're inside that spaceship, then you would essentially feel artificial gravity. The acceleration of the space, spaceship at that 1G rate would give you a concept of weight, okay? The rate of 1G, 1G is, a, is a, a measurement of acceleration, by the way. That's a meters per second per second, okay? So um, here, let me show you just the, like the units of it, right? So you can see... Where's the first time that we have, right? So that we see the units of acceleration, meters per second per second, so just meters per second squared, okay? So that, that value that we take for granted on Earth is 9.8, approximately 10, okay? So here's the idea, though, about this, you know, it's the sudden stop being, that's what, we're, that's what I'm elaborating on here, is that sudden stop. Well, in the, in the case of the spaceship, it's not a sudden stop, it's, it could be gradual. So now you, that spaceship that was accelerating at 1G, let's say now it, it turns its, you know, its drive, its, its, you know, yeah, its thrusters up in terms of you know, how much fuel they're burning, and then they generate a greater force that causes a greater acceleration because, you know, say it's the same mass of the spaceship. Right? That's Newton's second law, by the way. That relationship between force and mass and acceleration, the term we're just, we've just introduced, okay? Now, that you could maintain that, right? But I, I said I said we're not. We're you know we're burning more fuel. So now let's say the acceleration goes up to two G, three G. Well, it turns out that those those humans, by the way, could survive that. You would feel twice as heavy at two G, right? Which is about ten meters per second squared. You'd feel three times as heavy at three G, which is thirty meters per second squared. I know I keep saying that it's a real common shorthand to say G, right? But that's just a measurement of acceleration. Okay, all right, free fall acceleration. So but you could keep cranking it up, right? And at some point, and this is something that, that you know, astronauts prepare for uh, because when they're, when they're going up to the atmosphere, they experience values, I think around 5G. I didn't, I didn't uh, look it up before this, so, um, so I don't, I know, I know it's, it's certainly less than 10 because it, you, can, you can push up to that double digit of Gs, but become, it starts becoming serious, seriously fatal or a serious chance of becoming fatal, honestly. There's a lot that can go wrong, um, biologically speaking, because we're made of, you know, complicated fluids and, you know, on a small scale, and those are the ones that end up, um, you know, failing at those incredibly, incredibly high accelerations in the same way that there's not a, you know, a health failure in this case, in this, in this kind of, you know, upset tummy from a sudden, sudden acceleration, like from a roller coaster, right? In this case, it kind of showed from an elevator, but imagine this is a more, you know, more dramatic case, right? Although I'm sure some people get sick on an elevator. Point being is that that's just you know a disruption of, of the you know those fluids in your stomach. They have what's known as inertia. They want to stay in place, and when when they accelerate, then things get moved around, and it, your nerves it, it respond to that movement. Now, if you're going to be going up to like you know as I said up to the human limit of let's say 8G, right? But you know that that's well beyond safety. I don't I don't think people that actually get launched into space experience that. I believe it's as, as I said around four or five. Point being is that as you go up into those, those higher values of G, it's not about just being unpleasant, it's about losing consciousness, and then uh, one significant thing is having a brain aneurysm because of some failures of key uh, blood vessels, okay? Or may maybe it's even a building up of, of bubbles in the blood, I'm not, not sure. Point being though, is that if you do that with the fruit, to bring it back to the fruit, right? So if you, and that sudden stop, that is you know the, the thing we care about, so if you bring it back to the fruit, then you can have that same very significant acceleration, like dropping it on the ground. Let's say that one, you know, maybe is 100 G, right? And you could you could slowly go up to 100 G, and the fruit would just get more and more squashed, right? Because it would just essentially become heavier and heavier. And so you could ha have the the same effect that we think of as a sudden splattering of the fruit in slow motion, right? By just cranking up that acceleration, right? Because that's that's what really matters here. And it sort of breaks down, you know, kind of what we think about in terms of you know, a funny expression like this, you know, it's a sudden stop. Well, that really means something. That's, that's a way of interpreting the world, right? And that's what physics is all about, okay? So acceleration, as I said, is a vector just like velocity, okay? Um, there are lots of examples where we can look at uh, like graphs of 
um, or actually more of a figure, right? This would be a graph in the sense that it's, it's an XY plot, like a coordinate, okay? This isn't like a graph of versus time, which I've started showing you all, and you're gonna see more of in just a minute. Um, so you could, you could see that vector expressed in, in terms of its XY coordinates, the length of the vector is its magnitude, that would be its speed if it's a velocity vector. Um, and then when you, when you look at that vector, that's, that tells you its heading, right? So maybe you know, X represents no, um, west or east, and then um, your y-axis might represent north, right? Or you know, just whatever, whatever you know, your graph is. I have some examples of that. You can, as you can see, Wikipedia is in the background, and they've got you know lots of examples of vectors beyond the scope of this class. But this is a very typical, uh, you know, what, what how you would draw vectors between, um, you know, just it, on an x-y plot. Okay. So this is just you think of this as y as a function of x, or really in this case it doesn't matter w uh, which is which. These are just coordinates in space, right? Both y and x would be measured in meters. And so what you end up with is you, this, uh, what's delta V? Delta in all mathematics and physics is gonna represent just the change of. So we're looking at just a change of V here. And well, by definition, acceleration is that rate of change of velocity. So acceleration is delta V over delta T, okay? So that means it has to point as a vector, okay? If this vector's point somewhere, that's part of what, how they're defined, what they tell us mathematically. Well, the acceleration vector has to point parallel to the delta V vector, right? In other words, the delta T can affect the direction because time is a scalar, okay? Time doesn't have a direction, okay? Importantly, it can't be negative, okay? So since it can't be negative, it can't, or, you know, have some other, its own heading, okay? Certainly not an X and Y, it's not spatially dependent, time isn't, right? Well, then, you, you know, you end up with a situation where you have the acceleration vector being parallel to this one right here. So in other words, the acceleration vector would be some other length, right? Because its magnitude could change, right? Depending on how, how big delta T is, either greater than one or less than one, right? Well, then um, that would either make it longer or shorter than delta V. Point being, though, is that it would point in the same direction, right? Very importantly. All right. So that's, that's you know, certainly what, what we talk about when we talk about the ac acceleration being a vector. Um, right here, other, other examples of it, actually showing that acceleration vector in terms of these things called components, because you, you can turn any vector into, right, into a right triangle. This is crucial for really understanding them and doing mathematics with vectors, but we're not gonna do that, because that, that would require a lot of use of sine and cosines and tangents, um, and just um, not math that we, need, that we have time to spend on in this class, or do we, that we need to, right? Because we can appreciate physics without it, okay? But point being is that it's a common, common vector idea. Um, this this uh, nice little animation shows you an acceleration vector of a very typical thing. This is like a, this is a pendulum. You can think of this as a grandfather clock swinging back and forth. And what we're seeing is we're seeing instantaneous vectors, right? So you know, simulated with a computer, and instantaneous is always relative. It's like how many times per second is are we making the calculation enough that we assume it's approximately instantaneous? So we call it instantaneous. It's not an average over you know a significant amount of time. So anyway, and that, so anyway, those are the vectors that we're seeing. We're seeing an instantaneous vector in blue of, velo of velocity, okay? So the velocity is like the heading of the ball, right? So when the ball's swinging up, the velocity vector points up, right? Then notice the velocity vector momentarily disappears at the top of the swing. That's because this pendulum, right, at the top of the swing, like a child on a swing, is momentarily at rest at the high points, right? Both in the front and the back, okay? Um, the velocity is largest at the bottom of the swing, which also makes sense, right? That's where you've picked up the most speed. Uh, as we'll learn when we talk about energy, that's because you've converted potential energy, gravitational potential energy, into kinetic energy at the bottom of the swing. So we see that here, velocity vector is biggest, okay? But acceleration is what we're currently talking about, and we can see the acceleration has a, pretty more, a much more complicated effect that I, I can't um, spend as much time on, and we already go off on enough tangents, right? I do. Point being, though, is that it's changing, okay? The acceleration vector has a, 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 an effect here that is, that is dependent not just on the length of V, but also where V points. So as V changes in terms of, you know, kind of growing quickly in magnitude versus changing dramatically in angle, that causes the acceleration vector to do, behave differently. Um, in other words, the acceleration vector at the bottom of the swing is behaving almost entirely, in fact entirely, to approximation as a centripetal acceleration. And at other points in the swing, in particular at the top and the bottom, at the high points, well, um, so really top, not the top and the bottom, the left and the right, the high points, say that correctly, 
At those points, the acceleration is behaving entirely as what's called a translational or tangential acceleration, where it doesn't depend on the rotational motion at all. It's, it's not a centripetal, center-seeking acceleration. It's just driving it you know, stri in a straight path. But that doesn't last because this, they just think pendulums have a whole interesting mathematics about how they, how they function um, as, a, as a little wedge of a circle, okay? which ties directly into the angles of the triangles of the vectors themselves. So it's a pretty, pretty uh, amazing system. Now, the last um, thing I wanted to show you here um, was the so definition of acceleration and just um, oh, and just the little uh, the animation that shows at the top. You know, fundamentally, you know, what, one thing that we, when we think of acceleration, dropping something, right? We release release this yellow ball here and then the little animation, and well, at first it you know starts from rest and then it speeds up as it falls. Okay, that's that's the acceleration. You know, that's that's just, just kind of fundamental to what what we understand, and that that's what we're seeking to explain. Um, with the language of mathematics and the rigor of physics, okay? All right, so, okay, it is, right, vector points in the same direction as delta V. We saw that, example of that, all right? It refers to any change in velocity. I've said that many times. It doesn't have to be a change in speed. It doesn't have to be a change in direction. It could be one or the other or both, okay? In physics, we even refer to a decrease in velocity slowing down as an acceleration. We would call that a negative acceleration in a 1D case, or in a 2D case, maybe one component of it is negative, but it, we do not call it a deceleration, right? That term, it, you know, we might, show, might show up in a word problem, although I might remind you if it does that that is a negative acceleration, right? This is pointing in the negative direction. Right. So the direction of the acceleration vector Okay. Now think one dimensional, like in the figure down down here, right? Everything is showing up in a straight line. All right, is that of a change in velocity? If the velocity is increasing, the acceleration is in the same direction. Okay. So if we look down here, we're seeing that the acceleration vector, okay, is pointing in the same direction as these velocity vectors. All right. Vectors are arrows. Okay. Vectors have some value, some units, right? Both these would be meters per second, the velocity vectors would be, right? But their length and direction matters. Here, we just care that they're pointing forward, and we do care how long they are, okay? So then, this is the initial velocity. This is how much the velocity changed. This is the final velocity. The final velocity is just the sum of the length of these two vectors, these two arrows, right? Sum them together, you get that longer one, okay? And acceleration is not directly related to any of these lengths. It, because it, it depends on how much time passed. Because remember, the acceleration is not just delta V, right, in terms of its value. It's delta V over delta T. So if you're actually gonna have a numerical value, you have to know that delta T. And we're not, we don't, we're, we're simply not given it, right? We do not have that information here. All we can say for sure is that the acceleration is pointing in the direction shown, okay? Now, what if the situation was different? What if instead the car started at 18, and so it had a suitably larger initial velocity, so something that looked like this, okay, that's its V initial, and then at the end, it's then going to have some speed of, we'll say, four only, right? So it went from 18 to four, so it slowed down. And then in this case, the U would just be some little small final velocity like this, okay? So how would the acceleration vector look in that case? Well, if you think about it, your V initial is large in now my alternate example, right? This is our new V initial. Our V final is quite small. So the only way to sum up, you know, a third vector, so, you know, sum up something with the, this V initial, in order to get that suitably small V final, we'd have to sum up something that points, yep, you guessed it, backwards. So our delta V is negative, okay? So in this case, where we go from 18 to four, where the, the velocity decreases, our delta V is less than zero. We have that negative delta V, okay? Would that make a negative acceleration? You betcha, heck yeah, because the, the, the delta T can't be negative, right? Change in time is always positive. So anytime your change in velocity is negative, slowing down, that's a negative acceleration, okay? And remember, try to not use the term deceleration, okay? So the direction of the acceleration vector is that of the change in velocity, all right? If the velocity is decreasing, the acceleration is in the opposite direction, all right? There we go, 
right? It, it, did, I, did I repeat myself? Heck yeah, because it's the same statement, you know? It applies, it doesn't, it doesn't matter whether it, the acceleration is opposing or parallel to the, well, the, the initial velocity vector, okay? Now, the other case, you know, where things get two-dimensional but is kind of a good simple place to start is thinking about circular motion, right? So think about a, a car, in this case, bird's eye view going around a turn, all right? So in this case, we're not going to overly complicate it, so we'll keep the length of the vectors the same. So V final and V initial have the same length, right? So the speed is constant. That's saying the length of the vectors is unchanging. The magnitude of velocity is constant. The speed is constant. Those are all equivalent statements, all right? But what is changing is the direction, okay? So what we end up with is we do, we do this idea, we do this process where we think about vectors and adding them up tip to tail. And in this case, we're subtracting one because what is delta V, right? Delta V by definition is, right, right over here, so delta V is just V final minus V initial, okay? As numbers, that's fine, and they would work as numbers. Great if we were in the 1D case, like we were just seeing before, because in that case, we could, we could just treat them like values on a number line, and we actually don't need to really see that. We don't need to visualize it, other than it being helpful, which is why I, these slides are included, okay? But when we're dealing with this two-dimensional case, you, you can't avoid it. So we, when we add up the vectors, and we want to not, not have a value here, because we, did, we, we, did, we would have to at least use the Pythagorean theorem, but just to have a, an idea of where it points, we can just do this idea of tip to tail vector addition. Okay? So it's tip to tail vector addition. And all that is, is what's shown here. Okay? So if I was to add the two vectors, okay, V initial plus V final. So V initial was pointing this way. I'm just trying to draw it similarly. And then V final, we can see kind of, kind of points down, all right? So this would be the way you would add them together. This is V initial, okay, this is V final. And why does that follow this, this rule, this term tip to tail? Because the tail of the second vector touches the tip of the first, all right? So that's the tip to tail, okay, tip, tail. So that's how you add them together. Not tail to tail, not tip to tip, tip to tail. And that works for any vector all the time, okay? That is how you can graphically add vectors. And you can, you know, if you did it accurately, right, and then you use like a protractor and a ruler, you can actually get measurements, right? Before calculators were readily available, people did this by hand and got pretty good measurements, right, for hundreds of years, okay? But we don't need to do that, right? But it's still kind of, it's good to think about that. I think it helps understand this mathematical idea, which is important to physics, right? Vectors are going to keep coming up, all right? So, but we're not adding them together because delta V by definition is subtraction, right? Well, when you subtract a vector, that's the same as adding the, you know, the vector that points in the exact opposite direction. So 180 degrees the other way, all right? So adding, you know, negative V initial is the same as just having V initial go the other way, all right? So what, what we'd end up with is we, we would simply have the V initial vector pointing the opposite way, all right? So this one instead would point this way, all right? And then we would add them up like that. Now when you do that, that is the same in practice as putting them tail to tail, all right? And so subtraction ends up being the same as sort of tail to tail alignment. And why is that? Well, look, right, if I, if I took V initial and I put it the opposite way, so in black, well, it'd be already more clear to choose a different color. Let's make it orange, right? So right on top, same length, right? Same direction. The only difference is the, well, you know, the same direction as in the same angle, but more importantly is it's exactly 180 degrees the other way because what is this orange vector? This is negative V initial, okay? As you can see, that's the one that needs to be negative, okay? Just according to the definition of delta V, change in velocity, okay? Change in velocity points in the same way as acceleration. That's why we're talking about it. Right? So that negative V initial, right? Well, look, now if I'm doing tip to tail addition, I'm gonna take negative V initial plus positive V final, because it doesn't matter, you know, what order it's in, right? It's taking negative V initial, you know, plus V final is the same as this, right? See, same thing. So 
you know, that said, right, what's going on? Well, then I end up then with tip to tail addition, just getting delta V, right? So what does it tell us, right? Well, it tells us where delta V points. Where does it point? If we keeping these, you know, the, the angles exactly, um, well, or keeping the lengths of the vectors unchanged because we didn't change the speed, where does it point? Exactly to the middle of the circle, okay? So the delta V, by following tip to tail vector addition, points right to the middle of the circle, therefore, so, so does the acceleration. What have we shown with just this concept of vectors and a definition of acceleration? Why the centripetal acceleration is a thing, which is pretty neat, right? That's like a big sort of idea, right? We show that there is this, fundamentally, there's an acceleration that comes straight from the definition from the math, that points right to the center of the circle for anything that's following a circular path, okay? Or approximately a circular path. And what's the name of that acceleration that points right to the circle? The centripetal acceleration. Why does that matter? Because that's gonna explain things like, you know, natural orbits of, you know, like moons and planets. That's gonna explain things like, you know, man-made orbits of satellites um, and, you know, the International Space Station. That's gonna explain things like understanding, um, you know, where, you know, how, how forces are balanced in terms of, you know, like, a car going around a turn, right? Not slipping off of the turn and so on, right? So, so like, such a big idea with so many implications. Right? So many forces can create that centripetal acceleration, right? Centrifuges that have medical applications, right? In terms of separating different, different materials, right? That have different densities, okay? That's all gonna be driven by a centripetal acceleration and the resulting centripetal force, okay? Or maybe more from the perspective of the specimen, the centrifugal force. <laughs> There's a difference, okay? All right, but moving on, terms that we like to define that we do the same thing with speed and velocity is we have average acceleration, okay? Average acceleration is exactly that. It's average over some large amount of time, okay? So some significant amount of time, you'd be given, given the delta T, it's the difference from an instantaneous value, okay? It's the secant line instead of the tangent line, okay? We talked, we talked about this before, right? We talked about this idea, right? Secant is the average, See, secant, in this case, it, um, it was the average velocity because notice the vertical axis is distance, right? But if I just, you know, replace this vertical axis with uh, velocity, velocity, well, right away, what's the, what's the curve, right? What's the, the orange curve? Well, the orange curve now isn't a velocity curve, it's an acceleration curve because velocity is a function of time. The rate of change of velocity versus time is acceleration, this graph, is acceleration. Now the secant line is, what is it? Average acceleration, because it's averaged over some large gap in time, some delta t, okay? But if you make delta t, you know, so small that it's unmeasurable, then you end up with something called the tangent line or approximation of it, okay? And the tangent line, right? What's that? That's the instantaneous acceleration, okay? All right, so going back to average, right? So if you had, for example, a change in velocity of 20 meters per second, um, you know, maybe that, that change, you know, was noticeably varying over those, over some uh, the time, which here is given as five seconds, but you don't care, right? You just want to average it, right? So all you need to know is that they, you have an overall gross change of 20 meters per second. Maybe you started at zero, you ended up 20, right? And then it took five seconds to do it. In that case, you just, you get your, average acceleration, your rate of change of velocity per time, meters per second per second, okay? So that's the same as the saying meters per second, right, times one over seconds. Because you divide, you know, you divide by something a second time, that's the same as you know, multiplying by its reciprocal. So what do you get then, right? You end up with meters per second squared, which is the way we're always gonna see the units of acceleration written, okay? And uh, I mean, if you're gonna say it as a sentence, it would be distance per time squared, okay? It's acceleration, that's what it is. It's a rate of change of velocity, all right? So, right, so this is this average acceleration. We don't care what happens in the middle. We're not, you know, we're finding our measurements down to the instantaneous values. It's just a, a you know, an approximation, a gross approximation in a sense, right? Because we're just looking at some, you know, in this case, a five second gap, right? A lot can happen in five seconds. But that's what averages are all about, okay? And hopefully it also kind of lays down the basics of what acceleration is. All right, so instantaneous acceleration, that's the tangent line, okay? All right, and it's that, it's acceleration at some precise instant, right? We assume to be a precise instant, but we approximate to be a precise instant, okay? So it is the rate at which velocity is changing at that instant, 
okay? Because it's the slope, right? The slope is the rate of change of velocity per time, meters per second squared, units of acceleration, all right? So it's found by calculating the average speed over a short enough time, right, that it's approximated as instantaneous, okay? So let's consider practically graphing this, all right? So um, there's some slides where, that are gonna kind of be referring back to velocity. I'm gonna go through those quickly so we can get to the final idea with looking at a graphical represent representation of acceleration. And then I will be wrapping this video up because the last one, the fourth video in this chapter, will, will then approach or address a very common case of constant acceleration, uniform acceleration. And just uh, pay special attention to it and the equations. All right, so you're really gonna have your first set of working equations, okay? But first, let's get to these graphs, okay? So um, we're gonna describe a car's motion. Imagine we kind of tracked it. Right? These were data points that we tracked along um, you know, with some, some technique, right? Maybe we recorded the video and tracked it um, based on the known frame rate of the video. So we, kn we know at some time the exact position of the car, right? And then we know at some other times, right? Not huge you know, precision here. We're just measuring you know, down to one second, but we got some information, okay? So what does that give, it, give us? Well, it tells us the distance in centimeters, right? This car is moving across the tabletop or something or the floor and a, a minute, a total minute of movement. The car is not moving that fast, right? So when we look at this graph, right, since this is distance versus time, the slope here is velocity. So you can see that in this, this case, right, these aren't like nice natural curves. These are just kind of chunky data that was collected in a, a rudimentary way. Well, so, when you, so that means that over this whole segment, from about, you know, from actually from zero to 20 seconds, the velocity is approximately not changing, which is why it's just a straight line, okay? So this would just be a big segment of constant velocity, constant non-zero velocity. This is the car moving forward. Then, okay, the car is gonna get to a point where the distance, uh, you know, sits at 30 for, uh, is it 10 seconds? Yeah, for 10 seconds. What does that represent? That's when the car stopped, right? Because if the distance is remaining unchanged over some period of time, that means the car is not moving, right? So that means that here, the tangent line, Okay, which should also be the secant because there's no there's no real kind of you know because it, it's it's straight from multiple multiple ways right but here the tangent line is just flat that means that the slope is flat which means zero velocity okay so this would be a zero velocity for that segment of time from uh, 20 to 30 seconds okay so then right then we have another slope right we have another region if we were to average over you know say from like you know zero all the way over to 50 okay there we would actually have to draw a secant line because we'd have to take the overall average okay we wouldn't want to say average our three you know periods of constant velocity because they're not equal averages we'd have to do a weighted average so we instead just want to do this okay and that's a throwback to when we define how to actually calculate average velocity okay and the common pitfalls of doing it um so refer back to video two from this chapter all right so right when is the car not moving? We spoke about that. It's gonna happen in this period of 20 to 30 seconds. At what time does the car start moving in the opposite direction? Do you see a point where the car is moving in the opposite direction? Yeah, absolutely, right? Negative slope, right? This is velocity less than zero. That's a car has here came to rest, right? So here the car came to rest and stayed at rest for 10 seconds. Here the car just came to rest for like one quick second. It's like, you know, like the car like, you know, was like slammed on its brakes, came to a stop, but then immediately like kind of started backing up. So there's just like this one, like one quick moment of rest and back the other way, right? So one instant of rest and then negative, negative slope means negative velocity, which means moving backwards, right? Okay. All right, so the slope um, is the change in the vertical quantity, okay? So here, as since this has been sort of graphs that have honestly been reviewed for us, right? Um, in reference to acceleration at least. So, you know, here, since the vertical axis has been distance, all of our slopes have been distance per time. So all of our slopes have been velocity, as I've been saying, okay? Rise of a run, okay? So at what time does the car start moving in the opposite direction? What precise time? You remember? It's that instant where it's at rest, 50, okay? right at 50 seconds, okay? Then it continues to move in the opposite direction from 50 to 60, and then our data stops or maybe the car just completely comes to rest, run, runs out of batteries, okay? So we could actually then look at these segments of velocity over this period, and we have these chunks of velocity, either because the, the car was literally moving in sort of this jolting way, right? Which is quite possible for a toy car, or it's because of kind of the, the way that we collected the data, we weren't capturing everything, right? But for whatever reason, we have you know, this big segment of constant velocity, right? So if we were actually to graph velocity, that big segment would kind of, kind of almost look like a bar graph, 
but it wouldn't be. It, it, this would still be con you know instantaneous velocity or some rough approximation of that, right? But we just don't. We just know that it remains exactly constant, right? At a value, interestingly, of one centimeter per second. And where where do we get that one centimeter from? Right? We actually get it from from uh, doing a calculation, right? So if we look here and we say, okay, well, we know that this right here is 20 seconds, and we know it's going to correspond to 30 centimeters, right? So it looks like yeah, almost a little bit above 30 centimeters. Uh, what do you think? More more like a not a 35, but maybe a 33, right? So oh, I'm sorry, that actually that's a 15 centimeter. So 16, we'll say. All right, so we'll say that this is 16 centimeters. So our then, if we want our average velocity, right? So our v average is then just going to be our 16 centimeters divided by 20 seconds. Okay, so 16 over 20. Um, we'll think you know uh, that's going to be four fifths, right? So it's going to be four fifths of a centimeter per second, right? Or 0.8. Okay. So if you look then, well, our units of velocity in the graph, our example graph here, are ex precisely in centimeters per second, four fifths, right, 0.8, right, as a decimal, 0 0.8 centimeters per second, we can see that is indeed what the graph approximates, right? So I guess my, my values are pretty accurate. And there you go, you have that constant velocity for a solid 20 seconds, right, staying at that value, and then suddenly it just disappears, right? So you have this instantaneous change, like it just, as, you know, as far as we can tell, it just drops down to zero, then the car is motionless for 10 seconds and so on, okay? So that's what we're seeing. We're seeing this jolting motion of the car over these different periods of time. We're actually seeing velocity as a function of time, okay? That's relevant because that's gonna allow us to talk about acceleration. So let's, you know, let's look at, uh, finally, one more graph that shows distance, right, displacement over time. So um, here we're looking at position of a car with respect to time. Does the car ever go backwards, okay? So no, no U-turn here. Different graph, use the same logic as before. Make sure you answer it, you ready? Okay, right, absolutely. Just like the graph before, there is a segment, right, right at the end where the car is definitely going backwards. It's going in the reverse direction here. Negative slope means it's going backwards, okay? So, is the instantaneous velocity at point A greater or less than at point B, right? Think about that, think about the instantaneous velocity. Remember, this is a graph of position versus time. The slope is instantaneous velocity. Okay, so it's less, right? So the instantaneous velocity can be compared, right? So the steeper slope indicates the greater value, right? So the value is greater at A, okay. Oh, that's what I was asking, right? So is the instantaneous velocity at point A greater? Yes, okay, because the steeper slope is this one here, see? The slope that passes through A, this slope, right? We'll call that slope A. That slope is definitely steeper than slope B, right? which means whatever those values are, depending on the scale, right? Maybe this is, you know, 10 centimeters or something, whatever it may be, that's gonna actually give us the values, rise of a run, okay? And we would indeed find that slope A has a larger value of velocity, right? So this is velocity A, velocity B, right? They're precisely equal to the slopes, okay? So now let's actually look at another graph that is velocity versus time, okay? We, we saw the one that was, you know, the big, um, you know, look like the bar graph, big chunks of velocity. This one's a little bit more natural, right? So we have velocity staying um, fixed, not zero, but fixed, okay? Then increasing linearly, right? And then decreasing linearly. Interesting. So what's going on, right? So in this graph, is the velocity constant for any time interval? What do you think? Is the velocity constant for any time interval? Okay? Absolutely. Velocity is constant between zero and two. It's not zero, okay? That's not what we're asking. We're just asking if it's constant, right? It's some non-zero value. Maybe this is one meter per second, okay? Right? Maybe it's one kilometer per second. Who knows, right? But whatever it is, there's some value and it remains constant for a while, okay? All right, so same graph, right? During which time or interval is the acceleration greatest? Now, hint here, if you want a hint, if you don't, then you know, don't look at this part. But the acceleration, remember, by definition, is delta V over delta T. Okay, at least the average acceleration is, which is all we need here, okay? Well, delta V over delta T, if you look at the graph, right? That is rise over run, okay? So that means that on a graph like this, any graph that shows velocity as a function of time, velocity versus time, on any graph like that, acceleration is a slope, plain and simple, okay? And that, be careful the units, right? Because if the velocity is in centimeters per second, then your acceleration will also be in centimeters per second squared, 
You know, so there's, there's little pitfalls there. It's best if everything just stays in meters per second because then your acceleration will be in meters per second squared, okay? And time especially, right? Because if you're measuring your velocity, say, versus time measured in milliseconds, right, which is a thousandth of a second, be careful, right? Because then you gotta think about what, what units would your acceleration be? It will be milliseconds squared, all right? So that may come up, things to think about. Point being though, is that your acceleration is simply the slope. So I bet now you can answer the question, in which, in which interval is the acceleration the greatest? Okay, with the magnitude, by the way. All right, so it certainly is B, right? Segment B, which is between two and four, right? Because why? Because that's just the steepest, okay? Steepest slope, greatest acceleration for this velocity versus time graph, okay? Now a different velocity versus time graph. This represents a car that's moving in a straight, straight road, so one dimensional, we say, right? And it, we're seeing its velocity versus time. Does this car ever go backwards, okay? Think about velocity here. Does the car ever go backwards? Okay, do we already ask this one? No, this is a different question. Similar to the one we saw before, but different. Okay, no, it actually doesn't. And if you said, well, hey, wait, wait, but there's a negative slope. Well, that just means that it has a negative acceleration. So this would be an acceleration less than zero. What does that mean? That means the car's slowing down. So on this graph, remember the vertical axis is velocity. The only way that this graph could have shown backwards motion is if our graph, right? You know, if our line here, if it maybe, you know, did something like this, then, you know, remained constant velocity for a while, and then, or almost, con almost constant, crossed the horizontal axis. Because now in this segment here, this negative velocity, totally allowed, it's not negative time, totally makes physical sense, that actually is the car going backwards, okay? Negative acceleration is not. Plain and simple, right? Now, negative acceleration on a car that has negative velocity means that the car is going backwards and speeding up in its backwards motion, okay? But the negative acceleration didn't tell us that it was going backwards, the negative velocity did, which is really interesting. The acceleration actually only tells us if an object is slowing down or speeding up if we know the sign of the velocity. Because as I said, a car with negative velocity, so like in a region like this, if it has negative acceleration as well, then it would actually be curving, rather than a, a straight line here below the horizontal axis, it'd be curving and getting steeper, let's say, something like that. See how it's curving, getting steeper downwards? Because that means that it also is experiencing a negative acceleration, which is causing it to get greater and greater speeds, but all still backwards, so all still negative. So that's interesting. So that's a negative acceleration that's actually causing the car to speed up. Why? Because the signs of the velocity, negative, see, negative, and the proposed acceleration, also negative, since they agree, that causes the car to speed up, okay? Whereas if we have a car that is moving forward, by definition, positive velocity, right, above the horizontal axis, well, in that case, if the car was experiencing a positive acceleration, then we wouldn't have a line, we'd have a curve, and we'll talk more about this, okay? And we, so we'd have a curve of the, um, or ra if the acceleration itself was growing, right? So we'll have a velocity, right, that maybe is doing something like this, right? What does that mean? That means that our, accel our acceleration is growing in the positive direction, as is the velocity, okay? Since they agree, we have the car speeding up rather than slowing down, okay? All right. So another concept question. Talked about that, that example for a while, so we'll continue on. All right, so at which point is the magnitude of the acceleration the greatest? Okay, same sort of question, but now we just with this graph. So if you're able to answer the last one, you should be able to answer this one. This would be another good chance to make sure you understand. Okay, we're just looking for the magnitude of the acceleration with this velocity versus time graph. Okay, so it's absolutely point A, because that's where the slope is steepest. Okay, all right. During which time interval is the distance traveled by the car the greatest? Okay, so with the distance traveled by the car, how do we get that, right? So, you know, what are, we, what are we looking at here, right? So we're looking at velocity over time, right? So think about distance, right? Well, velocity by definition, okay? I'm gonna show you a neat, neat relationship here. One of these kind of key relationships that you can take a graph and turn it into a formula, especially when there's simple graphs like this that are lines, either diagonal lines or even better, you know, flat lines, horizontal lines, okay? But here's the relationship. So velocity, okay, is by definition, okay, distance over time. 
Okay? And we're asking for a distance. Okay? That's, why I'm, that's why I bring it up. Okay? Well, if you look here then, you see that the distance is velocity times time. Well, that's interesting. Because think about the graph, right? The graph is velocity versus time. That means if I was to say draw a rectangle right here, right? Make that kind of the right, right shape. And say I shaded that rectangle in, well that, that area encompassed by the rectangle, that would have a height with units of velocity. Right? So you know, it's weird because we're thinking about uh, a, a space, like a rectangle, right? But instead of measuring it you know, in heights and inches and you know, width and inches, we're measuring its height and velocity. So our, an abstract idea, but it works. And we're going to measure its width and time. Okay? So what then would be the units of that area enclosed by this rectangle? Well, you can see, right? Velocity times time, it's distance. Okay? The area is distance. The area enclosed is distance, okay, traveled, plain and simple. We can see it works out in terms of the dimensions, which are the units, but we call them physical dimensions, because, right, distance, meters, okay? Well, velocity was meters per second. We multiply that by seconds. We see what's happened is the seconds that have canceled. So, of course, we're just left with meters and meters, okay? So this is a true equation in physics. All equations must have equal units on both sides, otherwise, it's either just a lie or a mistake, okay? <laughs> One of the two, okay? But, right, we worked out this relationship. We have then that the units enclosed by, you know, this graph must be distance covered. So it's interesting, right? Because, you know, I talked about, you know, I would say the simplest case, which is the rectangle, but you could then say that then all these different segments are then going to correspond to a few different, you know, covered areas, right? So we'd have, you know, this first segment, right? That would be the, the area of the rectangle, i uh, sorry, the triangle, get my uh, ge you know, uh, geometry terms correct here. So the triangle is not just base times height, but it's in fact one half base times height, so a very simple formula at least, right? Um, doesn't matter if there's a right triangle, it just works for any triangle as long as you know the base and the height, right? And so the next one would be the rectangle we talked about, that would be just base times height. This one, um, it's kind of an interesting shape, right? The way you'd want to do this, you want to split it up. So do a triangle, that which would just be this area here, Okay, and then plus another triangle. And this would work if you actually knew the values. Oh, here, just choose another color. Right? But the point being is that if you then sum those up, the sum of those two colors then would give you the area in that segment. But here we're just asked to compare them. We aren't actually given values. So which is the biggest? Which is the biggest enclosed area? Right? Well, I bet you know. Between two and four. Okay? That is the greatest distance traveled. So, wow, this is remarkable, right? Because when you are looking at this particular type of kinematics graph, right, this particular graph describing motion, velocity versus time, yep, this one, oh, here it is, velocity versus time, okay? Well, it's kind of like the, the most useful of all the, you know, because it, it compared to, the, you know, maybe graphing acceleration versus time or graphing position versus time because velocity is in the middle, right? Velocity is related to distance because if you know, you know the, the velocity over some period of time where it you know, conveniently remained constant and you know how much time passed, then I just show that then you can actually you know, find the area enclosed by the graph, right? Just based on a simple formula, right? A simple relationship that distance is velocity times time. So you can, in other words, you can kind of work backwards from velocity to find distance covered as long as you know time elapsed. But then you also can work forwards. You can find out instantaneous acceleration or average acceleration by drawing, drawing secant or tangent lines, okay? And in this kind of chunky example, you know, it's kind of the same one or the other, right? So over whole segments, you could just draw a tangent line, which is a secant, right? It doesn't change. And but point being is then you've got that, that slope right there is your acceleration. So you've got area being distance and you've got slope being acceleration, all from the same graph, okay? That's how graphs, showing motion tell us so much in physics, okay? So, kind of to wrap this up, we're getting right near the end here, which is good, we've been going for a while, is that, you know, this is the first example we saw, this was the toy car, right before we saw other examples, and I said this was, this was very much review because we'd already uh, talked about graphs of distance versus time a little bit in the, the second lecture uh, from this series, right? Well, well let's, let's then finally take it back to acceleration, right? So we saw, you know, we saw this chunky motion of, you know, displacement, Right? This resulted in you know, big chunk constant velocity, velocity dropping down to zero for a while, jumping back up to some positive value, and then eventually jumping you know, right down to a negative value, because right? that, that's when the toy car actually starts reversing, which is in this segment here. Okay? Because this is the slope being less than zero, the slope here being velocity, because the vertical axis is distance. All right, 
But then, can we actually then finally show an acceleration graph? We sure can, okay? An acceleration graph would just be a number of spikes, right? And depend and you kind of would want, almost want to draw them like, you know, infinitely narrow, but here we kind of are approximating like just a little spike, right? Um, this shows up in a lot of actual real data because what does the spike actually show us, right? The spike shows us these sudden changes in velocity. Because the velocity here, right, is, is remaining constant at about, you know, as we saw, uh, 0 0.8, right? And then drops down to zero. Well, going from 0 0.8 to zero, that's a negative acceleration because you're going from high positive velocity, relatively high 0.8, right down to zero, you dropped, right? So the, you'd have a spike of negative acceleration. So you have a spike of acceleration less than zero, okay? Because anything below the horizontal axis is negative. Anything above is positive, all right? And then you have a, a spike of positive acceleration where it jumps from zero up to, um, up to about half a meter per second and so on, okay? So that's what the acceleration will look like. Maybe it's not the most beautiful acceleration. It's not one of those like elegant cases like the pendulum or, or even free fall, which is just a flat line, but it's kind of realistically what happened for this jolting type of motion and shows you what it looks like, okay? Um, here is a more complicated, neat example of velocity. I oh, was actually speed because we're interested in the magnitude, right? So it's just speed. This is nothing, and and this is a car that we imagine the car gets on the highway, right? Um, you know, it has to um, you know turn on the highway, so they're, they're going slow on, on, when, they're on the, when they're on the on lane, right, or the merging lane. But then they they pick up some kind of you know steady steady highway speed, right? This is uh, you might think they're going really fast, but it's kilometers per hour, not miles per hour. Remember. Right? So going pretty fast and they, they get stuck behind a truck, but then they pass the truck, so they end up going really fast, right? And then they but then they're able to, you know, kind of hit another a good cruising speed, but it doesn't last long because then since it's a highway, not a freeway, big light in the distance tells them to stop, so they have to come all the way down to zero, right? Wait for that light to change. Okay. So that's that's their motion, one-dimensional motion, right? As far as we're concerned. You might be like, oh well the highway's like waving around, but we've like followed the highway, made that our line, right? That's our axis. Um, and so what's happening here is since this is graphing speed, okay, um, you know, versus time, at any point, the tangent line is acceleration. So you have lots of cases, right? So when, when the car was cruising, right, you can have this you know, kind of big segment where it's maybe slowing down just slightly. It's pretty flat. You got another segment here, right? Let's, let's actually overlay some of these, right? So you've got, right, so this, you have a big region here where the acceleration is about zero, right? So it correspond to this segment here because the tangent lines is flat, flattened out, right? The passing, the passing segment, you know, certainly that's where the car is, you know, really, you know, putting the pedal to the metal, really speeding up to pass, right? It really has to push the car hard, right? This is a large acceleration, right? So we'll say acceleration, you know, larger than zero and uh, maximum, right? This is the biggest case, right? The car's really picking up speed, right? And then it, it kind of, you know, just it, once it passes, then it, as soon as the person, you know, lets their foot off of the accelerator, off of the gas, right? They're gonna, you know, coast for just like, just a second and then immediately start to slow down, right? So this, this region here of negative acceleration, right? This one, right? This acceleration less than zero, that, that would just kind of happen naturally because you don't want to maintain that same, same high speed that, that you use for passing the truck because you don't want to use up all the fuel, you don't want to get arrested or you know, at least get a ticket. And also because as soon as you take your foot off the gas, having accomplished the pass, you're going to hit, get hit by a significant amount of air resistance, which you were working against the whole time, right? Because the car isn't just you know, accelerating for free, it has to be constantly working against friction, especially air resistance. Um, and that's you know, that kind of built, in, built into this graph, but it's an interesting story to tell, right? So these are lots of examples of different instantaneous accelerations over this kind of complicated motion shown here as speed, okay? And if you wanted to find the total distance that the car had covered um, from over this period of about 30 seconds, well, you guessed it, it would be the area under the curve, right? In this case would be, you know, you'd have to approximate it or something, something, but if you were able to somehow accurately measure this entire enclosed area, this pink area in units of you know, once you worked it out, you know, kilometers per hour multiplied by minutes, right? So you want to, you know, somehow get that over to meters or something, or at least kilometers, okay? Probably convert the minutes over to, over to hours or the hours over to minutes, and then just end up with units of kilometers. So you actually, that purple region would represent in units of kilometers, again, once the hours are converted to minutes, well, how far the car went, or that this whole process. Kind of neat, right? Okay, so lots of, lots of different values of tangent lines, one total distance, um, you could of course you of course find different segments of distance by segmenting it up, starting and stopping at whatever time you want, right? Uh, other than the example I did, go all, zero all the way to the end. Okay, I think this one is our last. All right. Uh, oh, this is uh, acceleration change for a sprinter. Just another example. I'll quickly go over it. So a runner, a runner wants to reach top speed, so they're going to do most of their acceleration at first. 
So looking here, this is this is a speed, by the way, S for speed. So their speed uh, you know, accelerates really fast and then quickly kind of stops accelerating. So there's this region of quick deceleration, right? Um, or leveling off of acceleration. And then the speed just remains constant, okay? So that whole region of constant speed, well, any flat region of speed is zero acceleration. So that's just the runner maintaining that, point, that, that final steady velocity, all right? So the velocity graph on an object uh, is shown is the acceleration of the object constant. Think about this. This is velocity shown for some object, like the sprinter. Okay, is the acceleration constant? Yes or no? Or can we not know? Is definitely not constant. How do we know? Because the tangent line isn't constant, right? Imagine at first the tangent line is you know it's non-zero, right? Right. Then it gets less steep, right? So it started off steep, in other words. Okay. Then right by the end, the tangent line is basically flat. So this is an example of a velocity, okay, that that approach some final state, which means that the acceleration, because this would be like a one, this would be a two, and this would be a three, right? Well, a three is the final one. So we have the acceleration approaching what? Zero, right? The acceleration is going down. The acceleration is approaching zero. If we were to graph the acceleration kind of simultaneously, right, on top of this, then the acceleration would start at some initial value, which is just a1, and then it would just drop down to zero with its own curve, okay, like that. That is definitely not constant, okay? What would constant acceleration look like or what type of velocity would it result in? Well, that's what we're gonna talk about, uniform acceleration, constant acceleration, and I'll tell you, it's gonna create lines, linear, diagonal lines, not flat lines, but it's gonna create linear velocity graphs. Okay, which is elegant and to give us some equations we can work with. And that will be the conclusion of chapter two, this last kind of workhorse topic of uniform acceleration. All right, well, I hope I see you all there and I hope this lecture has been interesting and informative. Thanks for tuning in.